Lesson 71. Hello again. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how I built this 11 by 14 inch view camera from scratch. But first, I should tell you why I decided to undertake this project in the first place. As you may or may not know, view cameras have been around almost as long as photography itself, and they have the ability to produce very large images with incredible detail and clarity. Although I already owned an 8x10 view camera, I wanted one that produced an even larger image but didn't want to have to purchase one. View cameras this large are quite rare and therefore very expensive. The other reason I wanted to make this camera was so my advanced photography students at the high school could use it the school year. I think they'll appreciate learning how to create images with a view camera and the ability to make high quality large prints in the process. The first step I took was to build an 11 by 14 inch film holder. Rather than purchasing a rare and expensive commercial film holder, I thought I'd design my own and hope that it would work out. Then if it did, the rest of the camera would follow that design. I began by purchasing a sheet of 2 by 4 by quarter inch MDF, which is sort of like really smooth, dense hardboard. I cut out a sheet 15 by 11 and 3 quarters inches and then used craft sticks, also known as popsicle sticks, glued along three edges of the MDF like so to create the space for the film. I then cut four pieces of 3 quarter inch oak molding for the channels into which the film or paper would be inserted and kept the fourth one for the opening. I mitered the molding, glued it over the popsicle sticks, then clamped it for drying. I repeated the process for the other side so the film holder would hold two sheets of medium just as the commercial versions do. For the dark slides I had ordered McMaster hard and strong Gerolite double X black 1 seconds of an inch thick 12 by 24 inches and cut out two pieces making sure that they were exact and would slide neatly into the channels. My next challenge was to create the rear standard that would accommodate a rear viewing panel that would accommodate the film holders. I knew I wanted the standard to be square so that I could compose both vertical and horizontal shots by being able to load the film holders from the side or the top. I decided to make the standard 18 and a half inch square. I used half inch poplar for the standard, mitered it, glued it, and clamped it until it was dry. For the panel, I began with an 18 by 18 inch piece of MDF and cut out an opening the size of the image my film holder would produce keeping it offset to allow room for the film holder to be inserted. I then built the track for the film holder using 1 by 3 inch poplar for the frame and 1 by 1 inch molding to create the channel. I used standard window screen clips to provide tension for the film holder and attached it using a staple gun. Now that the rear standard was basically done, I moved on to the base. I used 1 by 6 inch poplar cut to 24 inches long for the base. I mauled over a focusing system for several days until I noticed an old Bessler enlarger that had a nice rack and pinion assembly for focusing. I removed that from the enlarger and mounted it to my base as seen in this photo. I was so thrilled at how it worked that I was nearly delirious. I then started working on the mount for the rear standard until it was the right height to clear the two rods protruding from the gearbox. I used quarter inch bolts to connect the standard to the mount, keeping in mind that I wanted to be able to totally disassemble this camera when I was done. Once the rear focusing system was finished, I began work on the front standard. I needed to be able to move the standard backward and forward for focusing, but opted to create slots for the standard to move along for this purpose. I don't have any sophisticated slot cutting saws, so I simply used a quarter inch spacer and created my slots. I then made a front standard base out of a 2x4 and a piece of quarter inch plywood to get the height even with the rear standard. I used a combination of bolts and knobs to create a tightening function for the standard. I also wanted to be able to raise and lower plus tilt the front lens board, so I created a framework for that purpose. This time I used my scroll saw to create slots and then later attached the knob and bolt assembly to the lens board assembly, which was my next step. I made a frame for the lens board 6 by 6 inches using 1 by 3 inch poplar. I used a sheet of quarter inch oak for the lens board and cut a hole big enough to accommodate the lens. To attach the board to the frame, I used mirror clips. I used a standard quarter inch barbed nut and a bolt to attach the lens board assembly to the mount. My next challenge was what to do for ground glass. Like film holders, this stuff is expensive, so I searched cheaper avenues and saw that somebody used Rust-Oleum frosted glass instead of etching the glass. I thought I'd give that a try. I decided to make a removable ground glass, not knowing if this had even been done before. I knew that doing it this way would assure that my focal plane on my ground glass would be exactly where the plane would be where my medium was seated in the film holder. 
With this in mind, I simply created another film holder of sorts that allowed for the mounting of a sheet of 11 by 14 inch picture frame glass. I used popsicle sticks for spacers again and butted the glass right up against them before gluing the molding over the glass. I sprayed a few coats of the frosting to the glass prior to mounting it to the frame, keeping my fingers crossed that this whole shebang was going to work. Note the use of wax paper to keep the frame from sticking to the table. My final challenge was the biggest one of all, the bellows. There are places online that make custom bellows, but it costs an arm and a leg, so I started researching some ideas for making my own. A lot of the plans look very exacting and time consuming, not to mention iffy. Other plans look sketchy, such as one made out of a trash bag. I had not come this far to compromise the bellows, so I spent at least a week searching and pondering how to go about making a nice one. Finally, I found a site where this guy had used Bristol board and scored the potential folds using a ballpoint pen. He then showed how to make the folds and it all looked doable, plus it looked great. I didn't want to use poster board though, I wanted something that was stronger and would look like leather. So I bought some faux leather vinyl and decided to try an additional step. But first things first, I had to figure out the dimensions my bellows was going to be. I knew it had to be 24 inches long since that was how long my base was. I also knew that it had to be 18 by 18 inches on one side and 6 by 6 on the other. So I went ahead and bought some black bristol board and drew four trapezoids, 6 by 18 by 24 inches. Then I drew lines half inch apart along all four trapezoids. After cutting out the shapes, I used them as templates to trace out my four vinyl trapezoids. Then I spray glued the pieces together. Keep in mind that all the time I was doing this, I was wondering if I was even going to be able to fold this thick combo of bristol board and vinyl in such a way that the velas will actually open and close like in an accordion. Now that the four vinyl trapezoid assemblies were dry, it was time to join them along the edges into a chute-like shape. I had read that hockey stick tape worked best for joining the sides, so I used that. I didn't shoot any footage of this step, but basically you lay two of the trapezoids together side by side and then run the tape all along the length. Repeat this step until all four sides are joined as in this photo. Now for the fun part, making the folds. I can tell you right now to allow for at least an entire morning to do this unless your view camera is smaller and that by the time you're finished, your fingers are going to feel like they've been tied into arthritic knots. Begin on the largest side of your chute and bend the vinyl along the score you drew on the bristol board outward until it's at a 90 degree angle. Then fold the adjacent side inward all along the score. Alternate between outward and inward folds until you've completed all four sides. Then start with the next scored fold and repeat the process. You have to do this all along the entire chute until you're done. There's going to be times when you have to crunch the edges together to make it all work, but once you get the idea, it's just a matter of time. A lot of time. And here's what my finished product looked like. Not bad for my first bellows, and the good news is that when I squeezed it down like an accordion to test it, it compressed itself into a tight, thin package just like it was supposed to do. I then attached both sides of the bellows to the front and rear standards of my camera respectively, using Velcro strips just in case I ever need to remove it for repairs. I couldn't wait to test my new camera, so the first thing I did was try to make a macro shot of a vase of flowers. That was when I realized I had a serious problem. I'd mounted my 210mm Fujinon lens from another camera on the lens board, which clearly wasn't adequate for a camera this size. I was just barely able to get my subject in focus and when I did, the front and rear standards were at the shortest possible distance from each other and my bellows was nearly fully compressed. I had known this lens would be shaky, but not this bad. So it was time to find a lens that would work for 11 by 14 inch format. I finally found this lens on Etsy. It's a vintage 17 inch 430mm f10 Bausch & Lomb process lens manufactured in the 60s. This lens has no shutter, but I figured I could live with simply opening and closing with a lens cap. I mounted the lens on the lens board and was thrilled with the results. Nice and bright and super crisp. The only downside was no shutter, which I really wanted to have. I did some research and discovered Packard shutters, which open and close by using an airline. 
I bought one on eBay and mounted it just behind the lens. Here's the Packard shutter in action. Note the air line coming out of the bottom, which is connected to a piston cylinder assembly at the lens end, and this turkey baster I bought to use as an air bulb on the other end. I was even able to sync the shutter for flash by way of a sync cord, which was a huge plus. Now let's take a look at my camera in action. Here I'm showing the front standard movements that will aid in composition, focus, and depth of field. I can adjust the rise and fall by loosening the side knobs and raising and lowering the standard as needed. I can also tilt the lens forward and backward if desired. And I can also swing the lens by loosening the bottom knob like so. Finally, the standard can be moved forward and backward as needed. In the back of the camera, I can focus by simply turning the knobs forward or backward until I get a crisp image. Gotta admit, that Bessler Enlarger had an excellent rack and pinion gear assembly going for it. And here I'm changing the format by rotating the entire assembly. By rotating the removable back clockwise, I'm able to go from a vertical to a horizontal format easily. When it's time to load the film holder with film or photo paper, I slide the paper in under the dark slide in the channel provided and take care to push it in as far as possible. Keep in mind that you'd never load film or paper in a lit room like this. Note that I've taped felt stops to the end of the dark slide so it won't come all the way out of the holder. I discovered that removing the dark slide completely and replacing it often resulted in the slide going in on the wrong side of the film, which is not a good thing. Before taking a shot, I remove the ground glass and insert the film holder in its place. After sliding out the dark slide, I take my shot, replace the dark slide, and I'm ready to go. I totally enjoyed building this camera, and although undertaking something like this isn't going to be for everyone, I still wanted to share my experience with those who might be interested, or just plain have an interest in view cameras and how they work. I recently bought some 11 by 14 x-ray film and plan on experimenting with it in the near future. I'll let you know how that goes in a future episode. Well, that's about it for this lesson. If you have any questions about this podcast or have any pics you want to share on the Photography 101 Facebook page, let us hear from you. Until next time, goodbye. Mm -hmm.